He has already written well-received books on two former U.S. presidents, Franklin D. Roosevelt and Richard M. Nixon. In his new book, Donald J. Trump, A President Like No Other, Conrad Black takes up the subject of the current occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, his friend for more than a quarter century, and without question, a president like no other. Let's find out why. From the agenda's first ever guest, 13 years ago. There's Conrad Black. Good to have you back in that chair. Oh, I'm glad to be back. I didn't know I had that honor. I was your very first guest. Very first guest on the very well, first program. That is an honor. We're, it, you know, it's gone up from there, I'm sure. I hope so. <laughs> Let's start. Uh, when I said I hope so, I didn't mean that the guests were somehow better than you. I just meant that we, we try to get better yeah, as we do these things. Obviously, you're doing well, and you wouldn't still be here. Thank you. Let's start with the subtitle of the book, which I suspect everybody agrees with, A President Like No Other. The thing is, I suspect that most people watching this right now think he's a president like no other because he's an utter disgrace. I think that's yeah. not what you were getting at. What are no, you getting I at? I wouldn't say that, no. Uh, I, I really, if, I mean, you probably have a good grasp of what opinion is like in this country, and if that is what most Canadians think, that is most unfortunate, because the fact is he's been a very successful president. He's, in policy terms, moving in the right direction. Define success. For uh, him. Uh, uh, doing, uh, uh, doing what he said he would do and achieving in relatively methodical order, albeit in a tumultuous context, which is assured given the political turmoil in the country, uh, what, uh, what he enunciated as his program and was elected to do. I mean, he has sharply increased economic growth. He's effectively eliminated unemployment. Uh, he has reduced illegal immigration. He has made the point quite forcefully that the Western Alliance has to be one where there's more equitable burden sharing. And uh, he has certainly made a lot more progress in preventing the nuclear military capability of North Korea than his three previous, uh, 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 three previous presidents who fumbled around and were taken over the barrel by Kim Jong-un. I mean, he's, he's doing what he said he would do, and he's doing it as quickly as he can, and it's generally working. Let me pull one of those out of there. Immigration. Yeah. You have no doubt seen the pictures of the last week or so of yeah. families being split up at the border, the southern yeah. border of the United States. That's his immigration policy in action. He's changed yeah, his mind on a, it. It's a small part of it. And he has, it, look, that's the law that was there, it just wasn't enforced. He, he took the position, we're going to enforce the law, because they had this tremendous increase in uh, people effectively using children as hostages to get a free passage illegally into the country. And uh, it, what he did was something that could have been counted upon to stir up legitimate humanitarian concerns, which I share. But let us keep things in perspective. Senator Blumenthal of Connecticut saying it was like packing, stuffing people into cattle cars and taking them to death camps in Nazi Germany and so on. This is just outrageous. I mean, the fact is there are 2,500 of these youngsters and they are well taken care of. Now, I accept that it is not the optimal way to do these things, but it is part of, it's just a small part of this great struggle that he is conducting to give the U.S. a border. Because this isn't immigration like we celebrate at the Statue of Liberty. Uh, this is immigration that, that is like the latter days of the Roman Empire, masses of people just moving for, for, uh, territorially and occupying a new territory without any real thought of nationality, without any commitment to join and seek to become a productive member of another country. But you would agree splitting up families was not a great way to do it. Not great, but it wasn't his law. It was George W. Bush's law. I'm not in favor of phony laws that aren't enforced as mere window dressing to shut down a few people. I mean, it is a huge problem that has to be dealt with. 12 million illegal people in that country? I, I, I mean, you just can't do it, Steve. Mm -hmm. And what were these politicians of both parties for 20 years, what were they thinking? That, that millions of, frankly, almost all of them, unskilled, I'm not saying they're bad people, but unskilled people who don't speak the language of the country pouring in. And, and now we've reached the point where you have the mayors of the largest cities in the country saying, we will defy the federal law to identify these people as illegally in the country. And, and, and you have uh, states intervening to try and prevent federal census takers from actually asking people their nationality on a census. All right, let's pick out another thing from that list you gave of accomplishments, and okay. that is your view that somehow 
he is, he is successfully putting pressure on NATO partners to assume a greater share of the burden. And one way he has done that, I guess, is to call the Prime Minister of Canada meek, dishonest, and weak. And that G7 meeting descended into a bit of, well, it was not a success, let's put it that way. What was your reaction to his taking to Twitter to excoriate the Prime Minister? Well, he was in his plane, so he couldn't do it viva voce. Uh, I disapproved of it. I actually thought that Justin handled that well, and I don't think the president should have spoken of him in that way. Um, but he did. Yeah. Well, Why did. would that have been a useful thing for President I, Trump I, to I, have done? I, 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 well, look, I, now you're getting into tactics, and I'm suspicious of mind reading as a historian and as a commentator. But uh, I think the... I think it was a tactic that he is making it clear that he is going to get rid of the $865 billion trade deficit the U.S. has. Now, almost half of it is going with the oil imports, which are vanishing anyway. But the other block of it is there, and the big offender is China. But I think that he felt, and this is mere supposition, I don't know, but I think that he felt that if he started to pile on to Canada a bit, verbally, uh, it, it, it would send a message to all of them because he has legitimate trade grievances with the EU. EU. I don't think he really does with Canada, but as usual with Donald, he, he went for the jugular as he did as a businessman and he exploited the fact that there is a 270% Canadian tariff on imported dairy products. So a good idea to put tariffs on our steel and aluminum? Come on. It's all a poke. No, no, wait a minute. You're not answering the questions you put. I mean, I mean if you're going to answer my questions, no, no, my don't... presence here is superfluous. I, I hear you, but I'm just saying uh, but the, for the, national no, security no, 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 reasons. But I'm going to answer you. Okay. Uh, oh, national security just happens to be the avenue to do these things, and it's a broad definition of national security. Don't don't get frightfully Canadian with us here. I'm going to get frightfully Canadian. He's yeah, putting no, national no, but, security yeah, yeah. as the explanation for why he's putting tariffs I'm, on aluminum I'm, and steel. Does that make sense to you? Ladies and gentlemen <laughs> of this great country, I'm being filibustered. I'm being asked questions and not allowed to answer them. Uh, the, the answer, I believe, is that... Um, First of all, on the 270% tariff, it is an outrage, and we all know that it goes to deal politically with a very small number of people, chiefly Quebec dairy farmers. And it is a vulnerable point. Now, the official opposition tossed poor old Maxime Bernier out of the shadow cabinet for a brief period, sent him to the penalty box because it was well-known opposition to precisely what Trump is objecting to. But the fact is, it, is not, it does not lie in the mouth of the Canadian leader, any Canadian leader, to get too self-righteous about tariffs when, in fact, that is the imposition imposed on, on Americans seeking to export dairy products to this country. I think that that will all settle down quite quickly. And I just caution you seriously, no, no gamesmanship, Trade is horribly complicated. Only the wonks can do it. It's like serious tax discussions. It, it is so complicated that only a person who devotes his life to it, it, it can, can, can actually do it. You end up, I mean, at times I've had some involvement in these things, and, and you end up with uh, trading uh, the, the tariff on enamel that you put on uh, vanadized metal for the... Uh, number of coconuts or something. And it gets just terribly complicated. But the fact is, Trump is taking a sledgehammer to a problem that is going to be attacked by more sophisticated and appropriate uh, implements and uh, in the hands of serious people on all sides. Why does he do that, though? Because he, he wants to send the message that he is not going to just make the noises and do nothing like his predecessors. It's an outrage that the U.S. has had an $865 billion trade deficit. There's practically nothing that country really needs to import. It would just readjust to an economy that is self-sufficient. Now, I'm not an autarchist in economic terms, but the United States can't sit there having its pocket picked. I mean, just take the Mexican example. Mm -hmm. And I'm, this is, I'm not anti-Mexican, and I don't blame them. You do what you can do, you know, what you can get away with. But they enticed American companies into Mexico just across the border, taking advantage of cheap labor, mm -hmm. then re-exported back into the United States where they've just disemployed their workforce, and then didn't patriate the profits. They left them in Mexico. And at the same time, Mexico is facilitating this steady uh, incoming of hundreds of thousands, frankly, of unskilled peasants every year, which they won't admit into Mexico, but they'll pass them through from Central America. And, and uh, again, you do what you can get away with, but the Americans don't have to put up with that, and Donald is not putting up with it, and the public will support him. 
Here's the headline from New York Magazine. Yeah, Trump, I, 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 go no further. I, I, you know. <laughs> well, humor me. Humor me for a second. <laughs> well, okay. Trump is fulfilling Russia's dream of splitting the Western alliance. That's what they say. New, New York Magazine. And, uh, no one since Clay Felker, who founded it, could find Russia on a map. It, do, it knows nothing about foreign policy and not much about domestic policy. It knows a little about what goes on between the Battery and Columbia University in New York City, and that's all. Having said that, if you were in Russia right now, you've got to love what you're hearing coming out of the mouth of the President of the United States, whereas if you are one of the NATO allies, you are constantly asking yourself, why is this guy coming after us and cozying up to dictators all over the place? What's the answer to that? The, he's not doing that. He's taken much stronger anti-Russian measures than Obama did, and uh, he, he's... he's uh, the Russians didn't try to influence he's, Obama's he's, election. Uh, yeah, well, look, first of all, you're mixing apples and oranges. But secondly, uh, the uh, Ukraine, let's just take Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's supplied Ukraine with anti-tank weapons and drastically reduced the incursion of Russians into the Donbass. And um, he, he, he is not allowing the Americans to be pushed out of Syrian airspace the way Obama did. And he is making it fairly clear that he is not going to abandon the anti-Assad but non-Islamist extremist groups in Syria. And I think that's a correct policy. And he wants the Russians back in the G8, G7 plus one, G8. Is that a good idea? I don't think it matters. It's a ridiculous group anyway. All, the, I'm all these summit meetings. I mean, when I was a young person, a summit was a summit. You only had them every 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the people attending were the most influential political leaders in the world. Well, since you say summit, let's talk about the Singapore summit. Uh, of Kim Jong-un, he said after that summit, quote, he speaks and his people sit up at attention. I want my people to do the same. Now, I guess he said he was... A bit infelicitous, I'll give you. Infelicitous, I like that word. You're the only person I know who uses that word, infelicitous. But you know what? I, I believe it's limo just. I think it's an accurate description. <laughs> I, I, I know he probably thinks that's a joke, but there... And, and you know what? Let's... No, I, I, he wants to get earnest people like you jumping up and down in their I'm chairs, not jumping, and that's what he does. I'm not jumping up and down about it, but I am, I am curious about <laughs> the fact that he seems to get along so much better with people who are tin pot dictators all over this world, and those who have been democratically elected, who make you know make up part of the Western alliance that I think you prize and I think you admire, he doesn't seem to get along with them at all. And uh, again, I don't should agree with any of this, that? but I, I, no, because I don't agree with any of it is happening. Look, he got Kim Jong Un to the party by, by basically threatening to, to you know to take mm -hmm. him down militarily. He called him a rocket man. Uh, you know, he completely insulted him. And, and Kim Jong-un at least has changed the atmospherics. And so, so as Mr. Reagan used to say, we've got to verify what happens from here out. But uh, at least there is some sign of progress. Trust but verify. Yeah. Uh, um, on Just going back to Russia for one moment, it's a paper tiger. I'll tell you what the danger is with Russia. If he hammers the Russians too hard, I, I don't mean militarily, that's not going to happen, but mm -hmm. sanctions and uh, just mm -hmm. vilification, uh, the danger is driving them into the arms of the Chinese and the Iranians. Uh, Russia has a s smaller GDP than Canada with more than four times the population of Canada. It is a shambles. It's a, it, it is a, it's a great historic civilization and nationality. It's the country of Tchaikovsky and Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and Chekhov. No one disputes any of that. But the fact is, uh, it has not had one day of good government. It has no institutions that work, and it is a shambles. Alcoholism is, is a terrible problem, and it has a shrinking population. It is no threat to the West. He is not cozying up to Putin. He, he, he thinks that basically, if you're going to have a summit meeting, you should have the most important countries at it, like China and Russia and India. And, and, and he's not wrong. Okay, let's go to the book. Uh, and, and on Kim, uh, mm -hmm. he has sent the message very clearly. Kim has two options. He can either have the end of sanctions, respectability, economic assistance, guarantees of no attempt at regime change or uh, uh, compulsory involuntary reunification, all of that. Or on the other side, uh, there is going to be the military option taking out his nuclear program, which the United States Navy, with the three-carrier force offshore, Nimitz, Reagan, and Roosevelt, they could do that in, in five minutes. Uh, they, they certainly could do that. And, and that's his choice. And he understands that. Now, it is working. 
So I don't think saying he's cozying up to dictators will do. I mean, it's just not a reasonable description of his policy. Okay. I, I, I could spend a little more time on this, but I don't want to spend all of our time on this because we've got so much more to talk about. So let me go on here. Um, guys, I'm at the bottom of page three here, chapter four. This is how you describe Trump's inauguration. A starting pistol for a second, almost bloodless American civil war. And I guess I want to know why you think it would be a good idea for America to engage in a second civil war. Because that is what is needed to... And, and as I, I emphasize the bloodless part, I'm not talking about anything remotely Understood. like the real civil war in right. which 750,000 people died in a population of 31 million and five states were smashed to rubble and scorched to ashes by the armies of General Grant and General Sherman. But they, what was needed was a bloodless civil war to clean up the Washington sleaze factory. The entire government of the United States had become a shambles. Let me remind you, in the previous 20 years, you had the greatest economic crisis since the 1930s, brought on by bad American policy, both parties, both branches of government. You, you, you had uh, the virtually the entire conventional land forces capability of the United States militarily mired in the Middle East for 15 years in order chiefly to hand over the main influence over Iraq to Iran, which is the last thing they wanted. He produced this humanitarian crisis where millions of desperate people were scrambling for their lives and turning up in the shores of Italy and into Central Europe and so forth, uh, all caused by in utter incompetence in American policymaking. You had the decline of GDP per, grow, per, per capita growth in the United States from 4.5% under Reagan, 3.9% under Clinton, 2% under George W. Bush, 1% under Obama. The country was a pressure cooker. Poverty went up, violence rose, discontent rose, but you know, our great national media in the United States didn't notice it, and Trump said, it is all rotten. We've got to clean it all up. Wall Street, Hollywood, the national media, the lobbyists, campaign financing, all factions of both parties, they're all useless. We've got to get rid of them. And he's doing it. And it's a war. And he started by taking over the Republican Party, then the presidency. For six months, his own partisans, nominal partisans, the, Dem you know, the Republican delegations in both houses of the Congress, wouldn't lift a finger to help him. They're now, I mean, all the never-Trumpers are leaving. 30 of them are not running again. Corker and Flake and these people are going. Well, Ryan. You, you, you sound and dismissive he, he's about got this party behind him, and he's putting his program across. You sound dismissive of them, except they say... Yeah, that, I am. I am very okay, dismissive but, of them. But some people describe them as true conservatives. Oh, some people bunch. describe them as true Republicans uh, who think that the Republican Party has become a cult. Uh, 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 that was the uh, word used by Corker uh, the other day, a cult. Uh, may I have defibrillation? <laughs> uh, 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 flake, conscience of a conservative. An Arizona senator writes a book with the, with the name of the most famous previous Arizona senator, Barry Goldwater. And he isn't a conservative at all. And I mean, where on earth do these people get off saying that they are real conservatives? I mean, who is the conservative here? I mean, Trump has, has done wonders for the free enterprise economic system. The United States now has, under the Treasury, in the quarter about to begin next week, I predict 4.8% economic growth. When he came in, the conventional wisdom, Brookings Institution, all the, all the think tanks on, on the center left, uh, it, it was all, um, it, the new normal is you're, you, you, can, you can't really get what, to 2%. What's the size of the deficit now in the United States? Uh, 20 trillion. That's yeah, the I, debt, I mean the deficit. The annual well, net, we, we, net we, cash we, requirement we, we, for this year. April was the greatest month of tax revenues in American history, right after the tax cuts. So let's just see. I, I, th I, that's a bouncing football. But it'll, it, it will certainly, at these growth rates, come down very sharply. From your lips to God's ears. But let's see. Let's see. God hears everybody. Okay. But, but the, Here's a quote from your book. Let's read this. He is not so much a cynic as a methodological agnostic, not a liar as much as a disbeliever in absolute secular truths. Trump is untroubled by what he calls his, quote, truthful hyperbole and, quote, alternative facts that are, quote, essentially true. Trump rarely tells outright lies, such as the media endlessly impute to him, and a political leader who fudges facts is hardly unprecedented. For Trump, establishing the facts as a matter is as much a competition as anything else. Now, I must admit I pricked up my eyebrows when I read that because yeah. you're a newspaper man. Mm -hmm. You are one of the, I mean, I'm happy to say it, you're one of the great newspaper proprietors in the history of the country. 
Surely you believe in empirically provable facts, do you not? Yes, but I don't think the American media do. I mean, they're just, most 90% of the national media in the U.S. are out to crucify the president. Does the he, this president of the United States believe in empirically provable truth? Yes. He does? He, be he believes in it. He believes it exists, Okay, yes. well, d d you know, I, I don't have to tell uh, you, I, Dan. I, if you reformulate your question as, does he always devote his every utterance to getting as close <laughs> to it as he can, I would say no, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. And Daniel Dale from the Toronto Star has been keeping account. He's up around 1,700 lies since the president took office. D the Washington Dan Post... Daniel Dale has... I, I realize he's a rock star in the Toronto Star's world, but... I lost confidence in him after he was, uh, you know, peeping over the back oh, fence of the former mayor. Oh, now you don't want to say that. You don't want to say that because he got, he got an apology from from Mayor Ford about that. And, yeah, I, I, I'm and, not talking about about uh, anything to do with with children, which is what okay. the mayor got into. Okay. I'm not talking about. Well, that. the national, the uh, excuse me, not the National Post. That was your paper. The Washington Post has got mm -hmm. his false utterances uh, up over three thousand right now. His base is clearly untroubled by that. Do, do empirically provable facts not really matter in our public life anymore, in your view? I think they do matter. But I, I think what you're doing, I, I mean, I'm not saying it isn't a legitimate concern, and it does concern me. But I, I think you're seeing just part of what is a battle here. The fact is, the, the, the media just make it up about Trump. I'll just give you a few examples that come immediately to mind. Uh, he had his medical checkup at Walter Reed Hospital, which is where presidents go. It's mm -hmm. an army hospital. General Eisenhower and General MacArthur died there. And, um, and so they published it. He was in very, he's ex just published the whole report. It's an, he's in excellent condition. The CNN brought in some cardiologist to say the president has heart disease. Uh, the, the Acosta of CNN just announced that he had had the bust of Martin Luther King taken out of the White well, House. Well, hang on. Before you go office. there, that was a mistake, and they apologize for that. But before you go there, his clean bill of health was a paper dictated by his personal physician, dictated by the president, to say he's in the best health of any president ever. I mean, that's kind of shameless, but the isn't medical it? It's report, not true. The, the medical report is that he's in excellent health. He does not have heart disease, which was the point I was making. I mean, I, I just give he's you another one. He's in excellent health for an overweight 71-year-old man. It's astounding. I wish you and I had that energy. <laughs> uh, the... the um, uh, the congressman Scalise, who was almost just mm -hmm. murdered, you know, in the, by the, the baseball sniper. Game. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, CNN said the president hadn't been to visit him. The president and Mrs. Trump were his very first visitors after his family. As soon as they were told he could receive visitors, I mean, they just make it up. That, so this isn't a one-way well, street here. You, you say make it up. Uh, you yeah, know, the other media pe smears yeah. Trump all the time, other, every day. Other, I mean, Wolf Blitzer on CNN, who used to work for me, is the greediest journalist I've ever yeah, met. And I've you known said a that. few. Why do you say that? Because when he left me, left us, the Jerusalem Post, to go to CNN, nothing wrong with that. It was a better job, better thing. Fine, God bless you. Uh, shalom. Uh, but uh, but he, uh, he had the effrontery to write and ask me to give him a parting payment. I never got that from anyone else. Uh, okay. uh, but but the, uh, since you asked. But uh, look, I, I want to say one other thing. In this question of the integrity of the president, the broader question of integrity, uh, most, of, most of that hype is just New York outer borough development stuff. And that's how they talk. Uh, and it's, no, no, I think it's undignified and he should, he should continue. I think it's, He's moderating it, and he should moderate it a lot more, and the faster the better. I agree with you there. But on the basic point of enunciating in a campaign what he planned to do and setting out to do it, he has the best follow-through of any president in my time. And I go back to Eisenhower, watch them, and I think most of them have been good presidents. But none of them has delivered the way he said he would move the embassy in Israel. He did it. He said he would throw out the Paris Accord. He did it. I mean, he's... he's, he's He's not taking any more nonsense from the United Nations, which is just primal screen therapy for the most contemptible regimes in the world. He's a guy whose presidential campaign was based on a very nasty lie, which was that Barack Obama was a Muslim born in Kenya. He championed that for uh, a year or more and barely took it back. Yes, I guess he sort of took it back at some point, but a guy like you who prizes empirically provable truth I mean, surely would have had a problem but, but with you, that. You, you see, you, give, you, give, you illustrate my point, though, Stephen, though you didn't mean to. He didn't base his campaign on that. He withdrew the whole birther thing, which I agree was nonsense, and I always said it was nonsense, mm -hmm. uh, well before the campaign really got going. He unambiguously said it wasn't true when he was questioned about it after he denounced as a candidate. He did not say he was a Muslim, and he did not say he was born in Kenya. He, he, he suggested that he was not, in fact, eligible 
uh, for president because of the nature of his citizenship having been acquired after he was born and he wasn't automatically entitled to it because of who of the nationality of his parents. That's what he said. Despite he didn't say he was a Muslim was... born in Kenya and it wasn't the base of his campaign. He played footsie with the whole birthday yeah, movement. Yeah, but you, you know, he here did. you are denouncing yeah. the president. You are an honest journalist. Now, I'd, I'd say that. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve <laughs> is an honest journalist and generally you can believe what he says and that makes him something of a minority, a distinguished minority <laughs> in that craft. And you just heard him say what well, something that was completely false. What did I say that was completely false? That he based his campaign for president on claiming that Obama, who he was not running against, by the way, was, was a Muslim, born a Muslim in Kenya. He never said any of that. Uh, no, I did say that he played footsie with that movement. And as it, as it turns out, because he's a very persuasive person, as you know, 70% of Republicans polled believe that, Muslim, uh, that Obama was a Kenyan and a Muslim. Because well, of Trump's championing of the issue, I, I, I mean, if you, you that, know, but I mean, look, I, I don't, I, I never got into that. I thought whole birther thing was foolish, mm -hmm. and I couldn't care less if he was a Muslim or a Kenyan. I have other grievances against him, but that mm -hmm. there's something wrong with being a Kenyan or a Muslim. You, but but the fact is, I mean, his family lives in Kenya. His father lived in Kenya at times, and then then part of his family is Muslim. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But you, but let's stop. It's not an issue. Okay, let me try something else. You you <clears throat> cut him a lot of first of all I have to tell you you know the book is a gr is a very enjoyable read as all, because he's an entertaining as, guy well and because you write so well and you know him and are able to offer insights that other people uh, could not offer and despite your obvious affection for him the book is not hagiography I mean you no, take your no, shots no, at no, him no, where well, you look, he grates on my nerves too at times okay not he, in person when I see him but, but you, as a public person you cut him a lot of slack in this book on things that perhaps he ought not to be cut slack for and I think for example of that Hispanic judge whom he attacked for his ethnic background, where even the Speaker of the House, and even, even Paul the- Paul Ryan is the first one to the exit okay, ramp, and he's leaving the Congress. Even Paul Ryan said that's a racist thing to do, and you described it as a rather provocative thing to say. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you could do that, better that, than that, yeah. right? No, no, I, look, I'll tell you something. I suspect that what Donald said was actually true, that the man had a bias against him because uh, he, he he was associated with Hispanic organizations that tended to take public policy positions about illegal immigration that Trump opposed. That, but he didn't lay it out like that. If he just said that, I mean, it would have offended a lot of people, but not. But what he did say was, was, was reckless and stupid. But, but don't lay Paul Ryan on me. No, he, no, no, okay, uh, Paul Ryan is book. an economics expert, and I thought I, I, was, I was really pleased when Romney chose him as his vice presidential candidate. But he's a weakling. I mean, he's not a strong speaker. He's not a Sam Rayburn. I mean, he, you know, he waffles okay, in all the not, Look at what he did with his Obamacare bill. He I'm embarrassed not, everybody. I'm not talking about Paul Ryan. I'm talking about Donald Trump. You called him just now. Stupid and reckless in the book, you said it was provocative. So, uh, you know, I, I've, I've managed to get you to move a little bit on your view on that whole thing. So no, I'm going to count that as a minor but, victory but for me. But they're not contradictory. I mean, it was no, stupid, no. reckless, and okay. provocative. Yeah. All right, we're, we're uh, almost no, yeah, out of time I'll, here. You know, I agree with all, all three of those adjectives. There. Yours and mine, I think we're on parallel lines here. <laughs> okay. Um, how do I get into this here? I take no joy in asking this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. All the better. <laughs> <laughs> you know what people are saying about you behind your back, right? You know what people in this country are saying about you. I mean, to the extent that the, for those who admire you and those who care about you and those who like to read your books, you know what they're saying about you behind your back. Uh, look, I, Shall I, I keep going, or do you know where I'm going well, with I, this? I, I, I wouldn't necessarily know, but I suspect you're getting to this business that I only wrote it to get a pardon. They say you are being unusually nice to him and that you are throwing out your normally good judgment about all things political in order to get a pardon from him. Yes, that's what they're saying. I've made no application for pardon. But given that we know he's in a pardoning mood, because he does that, he's done that a lot already. Well, apart from, you know, Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson, the boxer. dead for many years. He, yeah. he pardoned people who applied for pardons. I mean, Scooter Libby sent in his application a long time ago. And, 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 and by the way, it's the right thing to do. He was but completely you, railroaded by okay, Pat Fitzgerald. Don't get me off the path here. Let's, let's go back to... I, you no, have not I call it as that. I see it. I, okay. I, I, I will admit that sometimes I, I move the... You know, the old-time radio where you just turn the dial, or some car is still, you just turn it up a bit to, you know, to make it a little louder. I, I do that occasionally in, in, in a miniature Trumpian tendency just to épater les bourgeois, I bet, you know, and get a, <laughs> get a bit of a reaction. But, and it's working. But, but, but in yeah. fact, no, I call it as I see it. I think he actually is what the country needs, and I think so far he's a very good president. He certainly has 
he certainly does and says things that are very annoying at times. I so, won't mince words. I won't say they're infelicitous. They're, they're uh, uh, unsuitable to the holder of so great an office. So but, then, give but, me a, but, but I, on balance, I think he's what the country needs, and he's doing well. And I, by the way, he is going to hammer his opponents. I mean, you can like him or not like him, but he's going to kill his opponents. In the midterms, or well, you think you know, I think he'll do what? well in the midterms, but uh, when it comes re-election time, I think it'll be 1964 and 1972 all over again. So 49 states to one, something like that. Well, or a 20 million majority. Yeah. Okay, yeah. let's uh, give me a couple of minutes no, left, guys, in the other control states room. He won't get, he'll, 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 it'll be a big win, I think. I, I guess I'm, I'm always so curious when I read your stuff. Um, you are a thoughtful, erudite historian, an intellectual man, a man of letters, and the man you admire in the White House is really none of those things. And I do wonder how you have this view of him when, you know, if you were writing the criteria to central casting for what you want in a president, he's got none of those things. So not, what is not, it? Not quite true. He, he, he does have some admirable qualities. He's fearless. He does what he says he'll do. His basic analysis is correct. His intuition about uh, the political forces and the motives of people, he's very strong there. Henry Kissinger, who I, as you know, I speak with quite often, uh, is very impressed with his, his judgment of some of the statesmen he deals with. And it's not because he studied them, you know. It's just he meets them and he comes to his own conclusions. But some of the stuff he says is bat poop crazy. Yeah, you're not, not crazy, I mean, yeah. but unwise, I would say. I unwise, mean, okay. I, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's all tactical, but uh, I think he could perform less abrasively. But, but the, and, and the trouble there, I think, is he, the attacks on him are, are, are so excessive and so destructive and unfair much of the time that, it, you know, it's hard to know where the war started. Well, he's just, as, far, as far as he's concerned, he's replying, he's returning fire. Well, that's it. What's the chicken of the egg? I yeah, mean, the but, I, I, but I accept, I think, your implicit point that, the, the 43rd successor to General George Washington in the great office of President of the United States should rise above that a bit and, and, and try and take the high road more than he does. I agree with that. Last question. I, but look, about, some of that is the attraction of opposites. I mean, I don't play golf, and I, I, I don't... I mean, while I know Trump, he's a very, very nice man socially, and a very entertaining man, uh, and, and very courteous. He doesn't talk over you. He listens. He's a, really a delight to be to have dinner with or something. But the, um, uh, you know, Roosevelt made this public display of, of loving his dog, and I guess he did love his dog, but he said himself, I am like a cat, and it was the attraction of opposites. He was a feline character, be like dogs, you see, because they were guileless and loyal and so on, and Roosevelt was tortuous and nobody, as, as Eleanor Roosevelt said, no one knows him, no one knows anything about him. If he says something and does it, it's a, it's a coincidence. Have you had any contact? That's, and that's after she'd been married to him for 40 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you had any contact with the president or his people since he became president? With his people a bit, yeah. I mean, I sometimes get messages from them. From uh, And I've, I've had some saying the president wished me to give you this message, but I've, I have not spoken directly with him uh, as president-elect, but not since he's been president. And what are in those messages, if I can ask? Oh, generally, he, he has expressed uh, his appreciation of some of the things I wrote in the National Review, where I write every week. Do you intend to apply for a pardon while he is still president? I don't know about that. Uh, I don't know. Um, I honestly don't know. I, w I would not do what those whom you mentioned impute to me. I would not do that. I think that would be uh, a mealy-mouthed and, and almost a dishonorable thing to do. I, I would not praise the president in order to get something from him. I have never asked anything from any government, ever, except from Mike Harris to allow me to drive my <clears throat> bicycle in a park near where I live without having to wear a helmet. And he, he, he did make that exception. That's the one thing I ever asked from the government. Well, since you mentioned a former Premier of Ontario, let's finish up by talking about the next Premier of Ontario, nice. and that is Doug Ford. Mm -hmm. How responsible do you think Donald Trump is and that whole phenomenon for the fact that Doug Ford is going to be the 26th Premier of Ontario? I think he probably made Doug a little more acceptable to some voters. But, you know, before he was there, we have to remember that uh, in the municipal election here four years ago, there were almost a million votes. John Tory, who's also a friend of mine, ran as, a, in effect, a liberal conservative coalition candidate. And Olivia Chow ran as the NDP candidate. And Doug ran 
uh, more than 100,000 votes ahead of Olivia and only 60,000 behind John. And he was just forward nation. There was yep. no party behind him. So, so he, there was support for them. Uh, the other thing is, um, while, while Trump may have made it, had been in a way, uh, this is the last, I mean, Trump would himself be unaware of this, but was in a way a bit of a pioneer for Fordism on a, at a higher level in a municipality. Uh, and again, I, I, I don't want to kick people who were down and gone now, but the, the, the McGinty win government, in my opinion, uh, was an absolutely terrible government. It, it, it almost ruined this province. So uh, you, uh, the conservative leader, if, if, if John Tory had been tactically wiser, and Hudak had been tactically wiser and a little more serviceable presentationally, um, they wouldn't have had four straight terms. But in four straight terms, they did terrible damage to this province. And so if, if the conservative leader, even if Patrick Brown had been there without any of these allegations against him coming up, they, that person should have won. I mean, any semi-plausible conservative leader should have won this election. And I mean, it's, it's like the Democrat in in 2008 in the U.S., or the, the Democrat in 1932. Mm -hmm. I mean, Roosevelt's running mate, when he said to John Nance Garner, do you have any advice on how I should win the election? He said, stay alive till November. I mean, it was <laughs> in the bag, you know? Well, it, it, and, and mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think Trump has loosened it up and given more confidence to, to, to I, I don't want to be too simplistic in this, but in the interests of time, we're running short. Uh, sort of the Archie Bunker vote, people who sit at home and grumble at their TV sets and say, this is all bunk. But because uh, it's a genteel world, uh, they don't say it that much. It emboldens them to be, to, to be more forward. And in many cases, as we saw in the United States, to vote where they hadn't been in the habit of voting. That's why a lot of the polls were off, because they, just, they weren't in the habit of polling these people mm -hmm. because they didn't vote anyway. I have to say, you are a great TV guest. Yeah, well, and, you're and a fine host. Keep, keep writing books, because we want to keep having you back here, and we are happy to remind people why you are here this time. It is because of your latest. Donald J. Trump, a president like no other, and on that, I suspect, all of our viewers agree. Stephen, thank you for having me here. You're, fine. Right, you're, right. you're a fine professional, a good friend, and please give my regards to your mother. <laughs> <laughs> Who I'm sure is watching, and therefore you just did it. Okay. Thank you so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.